Yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we'll start out today with uh, Kara, which uh, is joining us today. She is a Seattle based designer, uh, fascinated with engaging with architecture as a practical art. Professionally, uh, Kara has interned for NMDA, which is Neil Denari's uh, architecture firm right here in Los Angeles, and currently practices working as a project manager for SHED, architecture and design. Um, firm in Seattle. Um, and she also works on a variety of residential and commercial adaptive reuse and creative installation projects. Cara also works as a design digital publication manager for RDH Building Sciences as well in Seattle. And Cara actually graduated from UCLA right here um, in 2015 uh, with a Master of Arch Architecture and received her bachelorette, bachelor uh, from architecture from the California Polytechnic uh, mm -hmm. State University in 2010. She also spent one year studying at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, of architecture in Paris, France. I'll be handing it off to Kara and feel free to share your screen. Uh, I think it should work. All right, so today um, the title of my presentation is Artifacts and Illusions. Um, but backing up a bit, Maria and I both went to UCLA and um, graduated in 2015 with our master's in architecture. And um, I think we both thought today would be an interesting opportunity to um, present to you um, a couple of different experiences out in the working world. <laughs> um, Maria has worked at uh, several different offices um, and practiced architecture in a couple different formats. And in my personal experience, I have um, worked at just one office actually for the last seven years. Um, so that office is shed. Um, <laughs> and uh, though it's just one office, I've actually been lucky enough to um, work on projects of a variety of different scales. Um, and so today um, I wanted to present three projects. Um, among the three are kind of two different themes, like I, as titled by the lecture. Um, one is kind of an interest in the artifact, so something that is already there, whether that be a site, a building, or an idea. Um, and then the other is a playful element, <laughs> and let's call it um, an illusion, but something that is maybe um, a way about perceiving something in a different way. Um, it could be misinterpretation or um, also just um, unearthing something that wasn't necessarily known um, or seen originally. Um, so there are three projects that I thought I would present to you that I've worked on in the past seven years. <laughs> They're very different scales, so hopefully that's an interesting mix. Um, the first is called The Ghost Cabin. This was a site-specific art installation that I did in Seattle. Um, I'm going to do these out of order. The second one that I will present will be a large project um, that's called the Railspur Building. It's a commercial project. Um, it's an adaptive reuse, full seismic retrofit of an existing unreinforced masonry structure. And that's still located in Pioneer Square, Seattle. And then the last project, getting out of Seattle, is um, this A-frame that I'm currently working on in uh, Kodiak, Alaska. And that um, is a residential second home for some very interesting clients. <laughs> so jumping right in, um, the ghost cabin is located in uh, Chop House Row, which is in a, a fun neighborhood called Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. Um, the client, Liz Dunn, is what we call an angel developer in Seattle. <laughs> she um, did this extraordinary mixed use project a few years back, kind of doing an incredible job working with another local architect to kind of stitch together old and new in a very interesting and diverse mixed use project. So here you see like an existing structure and a new like mixed use building that's kind of interconnected. Um, there is an existing courtyard space in the rear um, and part of her, um, uh, her approach was that she wanted to drive traffic back here. Um, there's a lot of small retail, oh, sorry. Um, there's this existing courtyard space uh, and she wanted to drive some more traffic back here. So she worked with her curator friend to organize a competition. Um, and we answered the call and the specific request was to put a sculpture in the courtyard space. 
it to create kind of an aha moment for urban explorers once they reach this backyard back destination. Um, I think perhaps because we don't really view ourselves as fine artists, we're architects. Um, the principal that I was working with, we kind of envisioned maybe the project a bit differently than um, other proposals. We were really actually quite interested, not necessarily in the in creating a sculpture to place in the space, but rather in the kind of forlorn backdrop <laughs> that um, that the art installation would need to inhabit. So specifically this corner, um, it's a really interesting space. It's kind of a collage of, of, of several different elements um, kind of stitched together. Um, there's an existing stair, screen, and then admittedly some trash cans and rat traps. <laughs> and so um, our proposal really wanted to embrace this notion of collage and the idea of um, encountering something in, in a space and seeing it anew and also the space as well anew. Uh, at the time, I was pretty interested in a couple of um, photographers. This is Philippe Dujardin. He has these really cool site specific installations that really kind of stitch together an existing context with um, some, some sort of intervention that helps you perceive the space a bit differently. Um, similarly, um, we were influenced a bit by kind of the technique of amorphosis where you basically um, have, a, have an image that's distorted from all vantage points until you arrive at a very specific point of view where it kind of comes together all at once and you can see the intended, the artist's intended image. Um, we also learned through our conversations with the, the owner that there was a pretty fun and interesting origin story. Um, she had discovered uh, evidence of an old frontier cabin on Kroll maps when they were doing the original mixed use project. And um, she liked to think that there was this kind of spirit <laughs> on the site. And uh, we kind of thought that was an interesting idea, this, this notion of a ghost that wasn't necessarily readily evident, but that might be revealed through um, kind of a, a design process. So what we ended up doing in this project is we um, decided to project the kind of an, the typical gable form of a house silhouette <laughs> on the corner of the courtyard um, to kind of reclad the existing elements and um, create a new kind of focal point, but also backdrop to look out and appreciate the space that was there. Um, so here's just some fun little images showing how you walk through that little um, entryway and arrive at the, at the installation. Um, so while our original intent was to really create this, um, this designed, uh, focal point to be looked at. <laughs> um, part of the process was um, actually creating something in the space. And we have come to learn since that um, it's, as, I think, as, as successful as a piece of really um, uh, rich urban furniture as it is <laughs> um, a fine art project, so to speak. Um, it's been exciting to see like how it, the cedar planks really kind of warm up and enrich the space and um, people have really kind of gravitated toward it as like a backdrop and, and, a, and a space to kind of gaze out and appreciate the space. Um, people have gotten married here. <laughs> they host events on the stage as a DJ. We have um, First Thursdays, it's an art art walk in, in the district and it's just been really fun to see it kind of come alive in a way we never intended. Um, so again, I'm gonna go a little out of order, I'm gonna go big now. <laughs> this next project is called um, the Railspur Project. It's um, Pioneer Square Historic District in Seattle. Um, this was a, a, a big one. <laughs> it was a, a adaptive reuse project. We did a full seismic retrofit of the existing structure. And then we did this uh, penthouse addition, which I'll focus on. Oops, going backwards. Um, existing building built in 1906, made out of brick. <laughs> it was built on spec, definitely gonna fall down in the next uh, earthquake. <laughs> so, um, it had been around for over a hundred years and was full of different ad hoc tenant improvements. So a big part of it was just stripping the building back to reveal the existing structure. Um, here you can see the heavy timber um, frame. I did the full size of retrofit, installed brace beams. 
and then just you know generally just try to kind of reveal the the character of the artifact itself so here the owner actually even asked us to leave the patina on the concrete um cast clad um columns um but what i would love to chat about today is actually this penthouse edition um this is a, a was a pretty cool experience um i had the opportunity to work with uh, CLT on this project. Um, CLT is a really, really great material. We've, we've adopted it for several reasons. Um, first, it's kind of seen as like, I would say a very appropriate and modern interpretation <laughs> of you know the existing structure. So heavy timber posts and beam. Um, it's also really like um, uh, a, a sustainable material. I think it like, to produce it, it's, it doesn't, you know, require any carbon. Um, it's like very, it uses a lot of waste wood in it as well. Um, but another thing that's super convenient about it is um, that it is able to span. <laughs> and so we were able to match the existing grid of the building um, in a way that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise and do this all under a very tight height limit. So um, kind of the main uh, technique was that we ended up um, basically building a seat in the glue lamb beams that this, the CLT could sit straight on. <laughs> and so eliminating um, th this structure encroaching on the floor to floor area, allowing us to fit in two levels <laughs> underneath the height limit. Another main um, kind of uh, design priority was to try to really embrace the wood <laughs> and um, not expose too many steel uh, fastener connections. Um, so typically we learned in this process, you would, in a, a CLT project of this scale, you would typically, the um, CLT manufacturer would take on the steel and, um, and uh, mass timber scope. But in our case, they got separated. And so it was very exciting in my role at my office that I got to kind of act as the like coordinator between these three very different entities. Um, so here is just one example. Um, we built like a 3D model where we ended up modeling all the steel connections um, to make sure that everything would end up being hidden to as much as we could. Um, and so that we could really preserve the design intent of the project. So while you look at the finished images, you see like lovely wood wonderland up there. There's actually a lot of steel in here. <laughs> and it was very, very fun to coordinate. Um, so here's a, a picture of the finished space, still very raw. They don't have a tenant yet, but um, other than the steel cross bracing, you don't really see very many of those connections. And then just a few shots of the roof because why not? It's a sunny day in Seattle, those are rare. Um, so the last project um, I'll talk about is this project called the Kodiak A-Frame. Um, it's a second home for Dan and Dave Buck, and they are magicians, very interesting clients. <laughs> um, in this project, there's kind of three main, let's say, driving kind of concepts that are really influencing the work. Um, in this case, the client is a huge factor. <laughs> Dan and Dave have such an interesting and rich his history, um, which I'll get into in a minute. The site itself is just really um, remote and uh, a challenge. <laughs> and um, the whole thing we are viewing in this third um, image here uh, as kind of a puzzle. So that's a that's a picture of a tangram. It's a um, it's a particular type of puzzle where it's very open-ended. You can use these shapes to create all sorts of different um, artworks. And I think that's kind of embodies the spirit of this project in that like, there's just, there's so many different opportunities um, in this one for sleight of hand and, and wonder. So um, a little bit about Dan and Dave. Um, they are, <laughs> they're not really magicians, <laughs> but they, they are, have quite a presence in the magic community. Um, it was kind of an undeniable fact when we started the project that they would have a role um, more so than most clients in, in the design process. Um, they grew up uh, loving sleight of hand, uh, worshiping David Blaine, David Copperfield, and they ended up actually um, becoming um, 
they have, since they've been traveling since they were a young age, they've kind of also gotten to see a lot of really exciting and interesting things around the world. And their latest venture is this um, company called Art of Play, where it is a wonder emporium, as they say. It's kind of a collection of really extraordinary designed objects and artifacts. Um, they have incredible puzzles, but just generally these two have an impeccable like eye for design. And it was undeniable that they would be um, kind of a, a, a force in the project. Um, they came to us very specifically with a request for an A-frame. <laughs> um, I think they were drawn to the idea because of kind of the kind of the symbolic kind of formal pleasing shape, um, but also the kind of nostalgia that it in, in, incites, um, the sense of kind of intrigue and wonder and remoteness. Um, and ultimately in this project, we've got a couple of puzzles in front of us. Um, we have the site, <laughs> we have um, the brief, and then we also have um, the design itself. Uh, the site is in Kodiak, Alaska. Um, it is in an area called Cliff Point. House will literally be up on a cliff. Um, Kodiak has only like close to uh, under 6,000 permanent residents and have about 3,500 bears. So <laughs> it's, it's a fairly remote place. Um, this site overlooks an amazing vista of panoramic mountains and um, our kind of design intent here was to kind of really embrace um, and, and get up and see as much as we could. Um, so similar to this puzzle box, um, the clients also had expressed like a strong desire for um, something that was very well designed, which will be a puzzle unto itself, um, given the remoteness and like the local labor pool <laughs> in Kodiak. Um, We've had a lot of fun with them. Um, they're, they're really creative people um, coming up with ideas um, for the project. But fundamentally um, in this project, we're embracing symmetry um, in a way that I don't think we ever have in any other project. Um, so the house itself is like a 60 degree pitch equilateral triangle um, set atop a, a plinth. Um, and you'll see in the plans in just a second that um, the kind of the basic premise is that we try to put all of the heavy lifting support functions down below and then try to keep the A-frame above as pure as possible. Um, we presented them very early on the idea of embracing symmetry as well in plan about like a really strong mirrored axis. So here you see that it's kind of hard to see there's actually a mirror propped up against and the kind of organizing principle is a central core, which is the stair. So here's a fun little early model. <laughs> um, but the, by pushing everything, all the support functions to the, the lower level, we'll, we'll call it the bunker, um, it leaves, um, it opens up the possibility of having a really open plan above and allows you to kind of circulate freely around what we're calling the cabinet of curiosities, which is a set of casework that um, obscures um, and a, a central stair. Um, the dual purpose of this as well is that um, you, by not having to put a bunch of program up against the edges of the A-frame, it's a lot easier to construct. <laughs> and it, the A-frame itself is a very inefficient shape. And so it allows you to just appreciate it as like an unencumbered object and not confront it as much with like sequestered rooms or anything. So here's some quick plans. So here's that lower level, all of a whole bunch of tightly packed support functions. Central stair, if you can freely circulate around. Um, here's the double height space looking out to the view. And then up above, um, as they are twins, Dan and Dave, um, we have kind of two twin master suites mirrored about that central axis. And just some quick little sections. And then again, this one is definitely still under development in terms of design. So here's just some quick um, shots showing you how it's located on the site. 
um, inside, we're just now getting to the phase of getting to kind of dive into interiors. So here there's a door, but we're going to obscure it with a mirror. So it kind of reflects back the landscape, but also um, there's a sense of mystery in the house as it's not readily obvious how to circulate up to the upper level or let down to the lower. Um, again, a mirrored surface on the other um, access to that central stair. And then here we've got just more of the interior space. Again, trying to keep that triangle as pure as possible. <laughs> um, I like to think that this almost kind of looks like a spade, um, kind of evoking some of their kind of magic origins. Upstairs bedroom, some bathroom shots. Um, here's just a, a rear elevation. So fun site, really steep, uh, totally lower levels totally hunkered into the landscape here. And then from the other side, also doing a little like sauna banya structure as well, um, inspired by tan grand shapes at Puzzle. And then just a, a kind of a parting image. But yeah, this has been a fun one. And with that, I guess I will hand it over to Maria. For our second lecture today, we are joined by Maria. Um, sorry about that. We are joined by Maria, who is a Los Angeles-based architect and educator. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Michigan, and she relocated to Los Angeles to pursue her Master of Architecture uh, here at the department at UCLA as well. And then during her time in grad school, she fell in love with and was intent on uh, pursuing a career in the city. So Maria graduated from this AUD program back in 2015 uh, with the top thesis prize. Um, and since then she has worked uh, in the Los Angeles office of SOM and most recently as a project architect at NBBJ. Uh, she is interested in exploring human experience and the intersection of public and private realms uh, via design of large scale buildings in urban environments. She's worked with a range of programmatic spheres, including government, office, medical, and educational buildings. Recently, she has shifted to uh, smaller work, smaller scale work, uh, mainly focusing on residential projects here in Los Angeles and the Bay Area. And she's currently collaborating with small female-led practices. Uh, Maria is dedicated to discovering the essence of space and place within each project with an emphasis on material expression and clarity of details. Maria is licensed in California as well as in Michigan, and she is a current lecturer at Cal Poly Pomona, teaching construction lectures um, and second year design studio courses. So thank you so much for joining us, Maria. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Kara. That was such a great lecture. I was really excited to see that last project because I haven't seen that yet. Um, well, just to follow up on some things that Kara was talking about, so we graduated in the same year, but we've had quite kind of different career trajectories. Um, but we did kind of structure our lectures to give you um, a, a similar kind of, uh, range of scales, ranging from large to small, but um, quite different in terms of um, kind of their expression and the kind of firms that we've um, that we've been working at. Um, so I just want to start with actually my um, my thesis project. So a few slides here to set up um, uh, the conversation and some of the themes that I'll be talking about through um, through the project. So the first one is um, a theme of line. So continuous extent of length, straight or curved, the trace of a moving point. Um, and so here the line is something that travels in the 3D realm, and lines are ultimately what define a space, both on a conceptual and then the material or physical uh, level. Uh, the second theme is material, so relating to, derived from, or consisting of matter. So this is um, this is the model for my thesis project, and um, when I was in grad school or in school in general, I really loved working with models. So models for me were not just a kind of representational tool, they're also a tool to design with, a tool to work through um, through problems with. And so um, as you're all kind of starting off your architectural education, I highly um, kind of encourage you to really, um, you know, facilitate that kind of uh, 
tactile knowledge and um, embrace model building. And then the third theme is that of catalog or cataloging. So a complete enumeration of items arranged systematically. So this is driven by a systems-based approach to design. So that's, um, that's a theme in my work and we'll see that today, but um, using systems as a tool and then creating space out of that um, out of that framework. So in this particular image, we're seeing the kind of catalog of all of the different bays that were within my thesis project um, that were first developed individually and then arranged um, into a complete whole. And then once they're out of context in this um, from this catalog, they really transform into um, from what's a kind of aggregated process to a carved space. So um, all kind of rooting back to um, the original system. So um, again, I've worked in several offices, and so here I have three projects of three different scales, and they're all going to be from a different uh, different office, and they're all going to be slightly different stages of what I'll call existence. Um, so the first project will be the Long Beach Civic Center, uh, which is a project I work, worked on at uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, or SOM. Um, the second project on the medium scale is the Westmark School. This is in Encino. And this is a project I worked on at NBBJ. And then the small is a house for two writers. material um, and catalog. Okay, so Long Beach Civic Center. So this is an institutional project. So it's composed of a city hall. So this is this is the city hall. And this is the port building. And uh, there's also a new library, but that um, I did not work on that portion. And it's a little bit um, out of frame here, but it's a it's a really, really large project. And so another note on all of these projects um, is that they're all ground up. So um, CARES, at least in the kind of first two projects, there's a kind of um, existing condition that you're working within. All of these projects have, for the most part, been um, on just completely empty sites. Um, so this was completed in 2019, and just as a kind of reference as it goes, so this is 240,000 square feet. So this is just for these two buildings, so this does not include uh, the library. And so it's a pretty complex project. It's very large, so it's inherently lends to complexity. But I wanted to talk about something fairly specific here, and so that's the concept of the line. Um, so what sets this building apart for me is the interior detailing. So it's an institutional project, um, budgets are going to be low, uh, material palettes are going to be fairly um, constrained. So we're really kind of working with a limited set of tools to create a really high-end, well-detailed, uh, well-designed space. And so this image is a construction image. And it just shows the kind of multitude of lines that exist within a building. So here we can see um, the curtain wall mullions. We see the sofa panel paneling in the back. Uh, we see the curtain wall beyond. We see the structure and the uh, reveals that go onto these um, exposed concrete columns. And then we see a multitude of lines on the ceiling plane. So the ceiling reveals mechanical, and then uh, lines and points that are created by, um, by the lighting. And so on, on the whole, this is a what I would consider kind of mundane image. Um, but there is a certain intricacy and a certain level of complexity that exists within this in order to make this what I consider a fairly kind of rich space. Um, so working with these lines that are contracting in thickness and length, 
um, lines made of points, and so they come together to make this kind of cohesive whole to resolve the planes, to resolve the different materials that are coming together. And so again, this is fairly limited. We're working, we have these concrete columns, we have this curtain wall, and then we have the, um, the GFRG ceiling here. And so, of course, all of that, all every single line that you see in the building has to get documented within a drawing set. So um, for me, the reflected ceiling plan is a kind of highly underrated drawing. It's one of my favorite drawings. Um, and so this is what, what we're looking at here. And so we can see each and every line that has been meticulously placed on the ceiling, um, reflected ceiling drawing for, um, for something like this to come together. So these are two images of um, two corridors within, um, within this project. So the image on the left, so this is on the ground floor, it's in a space called um, the pre-function, which uh, there is a, a large um, uh, meeting chamber behind this wall. Um, and then this is a typical floor um, corridor. And so this project takes quite seriously the interaction of the different planes and materials, um, working with reveals and tolerances that allow for the resolution of these planes and their dissimilar materials allowing each to continue their proximate but independent existence. So for example, that is a concept that we see here where we introduce a reveal between the ceiling plane and the exposed shear wall to allow for the continuity of that material. And so when we're working with exposed materials and um, exposed structural materials as opposed to cladding everything, there's another layer of resolution that needs to happen, which is to coordinate the construction of, um, of those elements. So uh, concrete is made out of formwork and form ties. And so it was a meticulous process to design that formwork so you have really nice clean lines and that we have a perfect grid of formwork ties along this wall as it is part of the expression of the space. It is not getting covered up. <clears throat> In uh, this image on the left, so back to the pre-function. So this is a GFRG wall, which stands for glass fiber reinforced gypsum. And so that material allows for this kind of complex form that we're seeing here. So these, um, this fluted relief which is echoing the mullions of the curtain wall. And then the integration of systems. So we see some shadowing down here. So this is actually uh, mechanical grills that have been integrated into this wall. And so there's a sense of continuity and we're not seeing any kind of interruption, um, sporadic interruption of these services, uh, these systems um, and any of the other uh, planes. And so this is a detailed drawing of that um, of that first corridor, the the um, the GFRG wall. And so we can see the kind of gymnastics that the ceiling is going through. So creating a, a plane with equal reveals on the sides, and then pulling back to allow for the continuity of the curtain wall so we don't have shadows that are created by placing surfaces right up against the glass. Uh, integrating lighting for a subtle and indirect effects. And then just a couple more slides on this project. So I could talk about this project for a really long time, but just to kind of narrow, um, narrow the focus here. And so this was a really fun um, part of the project. So these were um, display cases. So this is a port headquarters and they have a large collection 
of ships that have been given to them by different shipping companies and so they wanted to display them in their lobby. And so the original intent was to actually take a shipping container and then slice it up. Um, there were both kind of structural issues and political issues that arose from that because each shipping company has uh, their particular colors. So we had to stay away from any sort of reference to a particular um, company. Um, so that kind of complicated it, but also just slicing up an existing um, a shipping container is much harder than it seems. Um, so these were actually just made from scratch to look like they were, um, they were sliced. Um, and then we have really nice kind of uh, floating shelves so that the ships themselves appear to be floating. So glass shelves here. And then this was a, um, a kind of preliminary uh, design where this was still considering the actual kind of slicing. Um, but in, the system is still the same, except you just start from um, raw materials rather than slice. But um, this was a really fun uh, pro project within a project. Okay, so this next project, so this is a school, and I would like to explore the, um, the role of a material within a project via this, um, via the school. So this project is um, in construction right now. Um, so I worked uh, on most of the documentation for the project, but because I'm not in the office anymore, I won't see the, uh, through the construction, but it was, it was also a really fun project. So this is a private school in Encino, and it's for um, grades two to 12. And they have an alternative teaching model. And so that lends to really small class sizes. So this particular building is just the um, elementary school part. So they have separate Marina? buildings for middle school. Yes. Sorry, really quickly. Um, Yulia, are you able to hear Maria? I don't think we can hear Yulia, uh, but she said that she, I think, cannot hear you completely. Okay. Um, be on my end. You, um, you can. Yeah, I can hear Maria very okay. well. Maybe it's just it go. Maybe it's just a little choppy on our end. Sorry. The camera is a little okay. choppy, but the sound is great. Okay. okay. It's nothing. Okay. Should I keep going? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. Okay, so this particular building will be an elementary school. And then, um, as I was saying, they have separate buildings for middle and high school. So um, so the school emphasizes hands-on learning. And so it was important for us as designers of the project to use the building itself as a learning tool. And so the emphasis um, is on the materiality and then sustainability. Um, sustainable materials within the project. So the formal diagram is fairly simple. So it's taking individual blocks, which are the classroom spaces, shifting them to create outdoor spaces, both uh, below and above, and then wrapping them around a central courtyard to create a sense of interiority on this side, and then pretty expansive uh, recreational spaces on the other. Um, so in this plan, we see um, six of the classrooms. There's 10 in total. So this is the first floor. And then there's a meeting, a sunken meeting space over here. And then there's recreational spaces behind. So we have a lunch area back here, and then a basketball court over here. And there's actually a theater um, in a small theater space out in the back that's accessed via this, um, this grand stair. And the second floor is um, pretty special. So each volume of a classroom is independent of all the others. And through the shifting, we create these outdoor spaces that essentially are meant to be kind of outdoor um, outdoor classrooms. So we have roll-up garage doors um, to make this a, a kind of a seamless space from indoor to out. And then the dashed line over here, we see the canopy of the roof 
that is covering the um, the circulation space, the main circulation space that's um, going over here. And so back to materiality. So providing a learning experience through sustainable mater materials and tactility. So the primary structural material here is CLT, and so Karen introduced us to that. So cross laminated timber. So it's becoming a lot more prevalent, and as Kara said, it's because it can span. And so it is sustainable because we're working with essentially renewable material. And also, as Kara was saying, because it's laminating um, many pieces of wood, you're able to use smaller pieces of wood, and therefore you can use kind of waste material or um, size of wood that you wouldn't be able to build a kind of stick frame wall out of. So CLT here is primarily in the horizontal plane, so it's used for the floors and roofs. And then it's left exposed on the underneath here, under um, under surfaces of the roof, and then also um, in the in the classrooms here, the ceiling plane in the classroom. The other special material is rammed earth. And so this is used here as an alternative to, um, to concrete. And so concrete is generally not a very environmentally friendly material. Um, it's hard to get around not using concrete. There is concrete in this project, um, but we are replacing a pretty good chunk of it with uh, rammed earth. So all of these exposed walls that we're seeing here, that is gonna be uh, rammed earth. And so essentially you're taking and compacting raw materials like earth, lime, gravel, and then you're um, compacting it to create um, a solid wall, and then there's a layer of insulation um, in the middle. And then the vertical planes are clad in fiber cement panels, so all of this gray we're seeing here, which is an engineered material, and it's also a very, um, very durable material. And so all of these materials are really meant to not only bring a kind of sense of tactility to these natural materials, but also um, inform students about alternative ways um, that buildings can exist, alternative materials that buildings can use. Uh, this is the last slide on this project, and I'm including it here um, because it is one of the kind of few moments in the, um, in the building where you see all of the materials come together kind of in one, um, in one drawing, in one detail. Um, so we have our CLT uh, floor over here, and we have our terrace up above. And um, we have steel um, beams that actually help to support the span. And so those are those we do not see. Those are concealed within the cavities of the walls. And then some of the walls are actually just light wood framing because the loads aren't very large. And then for the gardens that are on the terraces up above, we have these um, concrete planters that are supported partially by, uh, by the steel uh, right below. Okay, and then on to um, my last project. So this is in the category of small, and then I'll explore the concept of cataloging through this project. So it's um, it's called A House for Two Writers, and it's with social studies projects. Uh, this We just finished construction on it. We do not have professional photos, so I'm just gonna show some um, in-progress photos. But this project is what's called an ADU, so an accessory dwelling unit. And so as a kind of independent and small um, designers and architects, this is becoming a really important kind of scale to get your practice kind of off the ground. Um, they're small in scale, and um, there is a really kind of big demand for them right now as people try to... Um, expand their footprints, add additional um, uh, rentable space, etc. But they're just 
they're because of their scale they're really great to kind of experiment on um so they by code they max out at 1200 square feet so this is what we have um this is what we have here so while this is technically completely ground up um the configuration that we're seeing here is actually driven by the footprint of an existing garage and so this is pretty typical for adu construction so it's um unless you are starting with um, an empty site, typically you're gonna be knocking down a garage to build an ADU. And so the existing footprint here by, ooh, okay, two, I'm gonna wrap it up in two minutes, Julia. <laughs> I'll speed through. Um, so we have an existing garage over here by keeping these two walls, we were able to keep that whole footprint here and then it became a kind of exercise in, um, in shifting. And so we have two of these kind of shifted volumes that sit on top of each other. And then this kind of colonnade or the intersection of, um, I'm sorry, not the intersection, but the kind of outer um, kind of wrapper of the second volume creates this kind of outdoor space. In terms of cataloging, we really explored the, um, a color through this project because we were trying to express the frame um, that wraps the front and then how does that continue to get expressed through the rest of the building. And so what became really important here is the cataloging of corner conditions where what's typically just trim is now becoming um, essentially pilasters. And so this is what we're seeing over here, this uh, steel column is transforming into a pilaster up above to continue the reading of the frame. And then last slide, just a few construction um, in progress photos. And here's one of those corner details. And then uh, one of my favorite parts of this project is, um, is the stair that we have. Okay, Julia, I'm gonna wrap it up here, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so now we'd like to open it up to any of the students that might have any questions uh, for either Maria or Cara. Um, so if you do have any questions, please let us know. Um, if not, I can start with a question. Um, I guess I was kind of curious about how you both managed to incorporate um, a lot of timber in your projects, uh, like the A-frame as well as the Westmark School. And I was wondering if you guys have experienced any advantages or disadvantages uh, while working with wood compared to say like fully steel structured buildings? I have not worked with any fully steel <laughs> structured buildings. <laughs> so I'll let you speak on that one, Maria. Um, I have mostly just worked with wood. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's a lot of factors. So it really depends on the client. So for example, in the timber project that I have, um, it's a school with a pretty kind of sizable budget and a desire to um, kind of innovate and explore. <clears throat> and there is a still kind of code limitation to how big you can make a fully timber building. And then it's also, I think, a little bit challenging, especially like with CLT, if you're working with contractors that have never had experience with it because it is kind of fairly new. So I think that's kind of a big challenge. You know, one of the projects in, at NBBJ, they were having a pretty sizable amount of trouble. Um, the contractor like getting the CLT right and it was like peeling apart. So I think there's some kind of logistical issues that might not be like fully resolved yet. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Does that answer the question? <laughs> um, we have a question from the audience, uh, from the people online. Uh, for Cara, were there any off-the-grid installation challenges for the remote A-frame house? Is it an architect's, architect's job to coordinate the power system slash water slash supply slash septic system, et cetera, or is that all done before you come in? Oh no, that's all on us. <laughs> And I don't know if it's necessarily um, always the case, but in in this particular project, um, where it's a single family home, so our role is to really help them 
get from point A to point B, and that involves everything in between. Um, I could probably give a whole lecture on that in itself. It's actually pretty interesting. That puzzle, the logistical puzzle is very, very interesting on the Kodiak project. You're on an island, everything comes in on a boat. Um, the site itself, you mentioned septic, it has soils that do not perk. And so you have to look at alternative systems. Um, and so it's, it's really fun, I think, in the role working at a small firm, you become kind of a person who wears many hats. You know a lot about a, a little bit about a lot of things, but maybe not a ton about any one things. But at the end of the day, it's your role, I think, to kind of be an advocate for the owner and also for the design. And you're kind of the one that's always holding all of those cards, so to speak, at the same time. Um, the Kodiak one's fun. Yeah, everything's got to come in on a boat. We've got to think about prefabrication. You have to think about like, how big is the crane that is going to lift the six panels for the roof? And are we in, how are we going to get the sized crane that we need? It goes on and on and on. Yeah. How are you guys getting power, Kara? Is it all solar? No, that one, there is power. That is one thing that there's, there's power mm -hmm. in the street. It was part of their um, the, the property development. If there are no more questions, Maria and I had one little anecdote as a, like a, a parting party, party favor to leave you with. Um, since that kind of, one of the themes of our, our presentation mm -hmm. was really about um, a variety of, of experiences working at different size of offices and thinking about your career aspirations as you're in this Jumpstart program. Um, so I'll just share my screen real quick. Um, so some advice that I got very early on in my career was to start thinking about four things when you're looking at um, in endeavoring in the design world and picking an office. Um, specifically, understanding that you may not get every single thing <laughs> at the office you end up at, but to understand like what really are your priorities and what will be um, the most inspiring and, and kick off your trajectory in your career. So the four items that really are worth contemplating are the size of the office, culture, the work that they do, and then also, you know, a fourth thing we have to consider always is comp compensation. And so just to kind of inspire you to think about this in the many different offices that are out there in the world, um, I've got like a funny collection, I'm sorry, of uh, chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Architects love chairs, but I'll just click through these real fast. They're all different designs, but they excel in different ways. And and place importance on different priorities. So you've got everything from the air on chair to the Barca lounger, <laughs> very functional, maybe not high design, but very comfortable. Um, <laughs> um, there's classics like the Eames plastic molded chair, um, still serves a very good function, but you know, it has a little more design aspiration perhaps. Um, you've got high design, um, you know, luxury here with our like halyard chair. Um, you can really test the limits in terms of like, this might be an example of the work, like really, you know, investigating formal investi uh, endeavors or even go further, um, really just think about architecture as, uh, as art. Um, but anyway, just some parting inspiration to try to get you excited about the, the field. <laughs> Thanks, Karen, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, this was really fun and I think uh, hopefully inspires our attendees today. Um, I think with that, if there are really no more questions, then we really thank you for coming and joining us today. It was a pleasure to meet you both and very interesting to see your work. And I hope you will join us maybe for some of our future summer lectures. Uh, we have an exciting uh, lineup for the rest of the summer. Mm -hmm. so. Thanks everyone for joining in today and uh, to the students have a good rest of your afternoon and all the classes.